All right, sounds good. Are you ready? Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of Grand Rounds here for the Department of Medicine at Washington University School of Medicine. I'm John Hickman, one of the chief residents. It's my pleasure as always to welcome you back to Grand Rounds. Thank you for joining us. I am very excited. We are starting to wind down our Grand Rounds series for the year. I can't believe we're already there. Uh, but we have a fantastic talk today I'm very excited about. Uh, please join us again next week. We will be in person for uh, down in Wall. We will have breakfast again that day. And then we'll have three more talks following that, which will be the chief residents delivering their talks. And that'll be it for the academic year. Uh, today, as always, uh, we will try to have a chance for questions with our speaker at the end. So please send them through the chat. I will moderate those as we go. And I believe there'll be some interaction in today's talk. So if you all can chime in with your responses, I will also try to relay those to our speaker. He'll also be moderating the chat some as well. Uh, here to introduce our speaker, we have a woman who needs no introduction, our very own program director, Dr. Dominique Costco. Dr. Costco, thanks for being here. Thanks, John. Um, I am very excited to be able to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Alvin Calderon. Um, Dr. Calderon is a core faculty member for the Internal Medicine Residency Program and a hospitalist at Virginia Mason Franciscan Health, where he completed his training in 2003. He has always been committed to medical education, having been the chief resident as well as the program director from 2008 to 2018. In 2020, he was elected to serve on the Association of Program Directors of Internal Medicine Council. I've had the distinct pleasure of working alongside Alvin on council as the program planning chair um, and very excited for his talk today. Uh, Dr. Calderon brings a social science perspective to patient care and medical education. Having completed his undergrad degree in anthropology at Dickinson College and a PhD in sociology from the joint degree program at the University of Illinois. His current interests include psychological safety in the clinical learning environment, applying a growth mindset to medical education, and understanding the role of shame, guilt, vulnerability, and courage in medicine. So please welcome Dr. Alvin Calderon, who will be speaking today on growth mindset in medical education. Thank you very much, Dr. Kosko. It is absolutely great to be back in the Midwest, even if virtually. And I'll tell you behind me, it's I'm in Seattle right now, so it's it's six o'clock in the morning. So yes, we'll be drinking coffee. And uh, Dr. Kosko knows that she still owes me a cup. So let's get into it. So I'm, we're going to talk about growth mindset. Actually, in that introduction, we're going to touch on a lot of things that we talked about, at least uh, in, that was presented. But let's start first with a check-in. So what I want you to do in the audience is to pause and reflect on the emotions that you're experiencing this morning. And I want you to identify at least two of them that you've been experiencing. So often our experience is uh, variable and many things uh, are happening to us at once. And so, and if you like, share in the chat some of the emotions that you are experiencing. So I'm feeling exhilarated, so I'm very excited about doing this talk, as well as some relief, just because uh, after this, I'm going to go have some fun. So let's see if anyone dares to share what you're experiencing. And as a presenter, this helps me too. It helps me calibrate. Ah, thank you. So I don't know if, if people can see it, but I see excited and optimistic. Uh, at least uh, I, I appreciate the honesty about being irritable. That's great. Okay, so if you're not sharing, at least acknowledge for yourself. Moving on, I have no financial disclosures this morning. And so what will we be talking about? Initially, I'm gonna give you a very broad uh, introduction to growth mindset. And then I'm gonna talk about how I have applied it in medical education here at Virginia Mason. And then talk about the myths, challenges, and the future. So let's begin. What is a mindset? A mindset is an implicit or explicit system of belief about yourself, others, and the world around you. It's how you understand how the world works and your role in it. We all have mindsets. It helps us disorganize our lives. For the purpose of this talk, 
we're going to talk uh, a lot about the research of this person. This is Dr. Carol Dweck. She's a, a psychologist at Stanford, and she's been studying mindsets or implicit theories for decades. And one of her early questions when she was exploring was, why are some kids, when faced with failure, seem to be defeated, deflated, down, whereas some other kids, when faced with the same or similar failure, seem to be elated, activated, energized even? What could account for such a wide range of responses? And what she came to understand through her observations is that we all have different mindsets, these different implicit theories. And we, in fact, go back and forth between perhaps two mindsets that she ultimately popularized as being a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. So let's really dive in and explain what that is. So we'll start with a fixed mindset. A fixed mindset is an implicit theory that you have, that your talents, your skills, your abilities, your clinical acumen are all things that you are born with. And as such, you are given, granted, bestowed an immutable, unchangeable, fixed amount. You get what you get. If that's the case, and you're put in this position where daily you have to prove over and over and over that whatever it is we're talking about, your talents, your skills, your ability, your capacity, that you have a lot of it. And so when life gets challenging and difficult, and it does as a resident, as an attending, then you will act out of this mindset. So for instance, if you are presented a challenge, if you know that you can overcome the challenge, you'd be interested. But if there's any doubt, why would you take on that challenge? It would just be an opportunity to show your limit. And why would you show that? Obstacles, you would understand to be the universe's way of telling you that you have reached the edge of your ability and you can stop now. Once you reach the obstacle, there's no further that you can go. Effort, well, wait a second. If you've really got the talent, skill, and ability, shouldn't everything come easily? So you might fear working hard because of what it might say about your capacity. Criticism and feedback. You can hear positive feedback, but what do you do with corrective feedback if fundamentally you don't think you can change? The success of others now becomes threatening because if someone is better than you now, they always will be. And this mindset, this implicit theory that you have, that your talent, skills, and abilities are fixed and unchangeable will frame the way you think about failure. So in a fixed mindset, when you fail, you are a failure. It'll define you. It'll embody you. This is a mindset. And as I mentioned before, we all go back and forth between this and another mindset. There is an alternative, and that would be a growth mindset. A growth mindset would say, oh no, your talent, skills, your abilities, those can all be developed. You can be taught, you can be coached, you can work on your skills and you can change. So then your fundamental orientation then is around learning. What can I learn today? What have I learned in the past? What do I need to learn? And so when life, your residency, being attending becomes challenging and difficult, you can act out of this mindset. So challenges, you would say, bring them on, harder the better, because you know a good challenge will put you right on the edge of what you need to learn next, and that's where, that's where all the fun is. Obstacles. Obstacles aren't in your way. They show you the way, and so you go right towards them. In fact, instead of calling them obstacles, you might call them obstacles, or as one of my colleagues would say, don't even think obstacle, think hurdle because hurdles are things that you leap over. Efforts, efforts while uncomfortable, you understand it as necessary because that's what it feels like when you are growing. Criticism and feedback, again, you can hear positive feedback, you will seek out corrective feedback because you will use it to improve. The success of others becomes inspiring. It tells you, oh, that's how good it could be. That's how good I can be. And then this mindset will reframe your relationship with failure. So you can take the Michael Jordan approach, which is to say, I have failed over and over and over. That is why I succeed. Or you could take the Serena Williams approach, which is every time I fail, I get 10 times stronger. 
So I'm going to spend more time going through a real compare contrast because I want you to have a good foundational understanding of the differences of these mindsets. So in a fixed mindset, it's about proving, I'm proving. You want to focus on looking smart because appearances matter. There's always comparison and, and it's other people. You understand your failures to be your tragedies and you will equate any critical feedback as equating to failure. I like to personify the fixed mindset as a thief. It is a thief that will steal what the universe is trying to teach you, what your experience is trying to teach you right at the point that it's being taught. This is really important. In the literature, this mindset as it's been studied is known as both the be good mindset and entity theory. We can contrast that with a growth mindset again, Instead of I'm proving, it's improving. It's focusing on becoming smart as opposed to looking smart. There's still a comparison. The comparison is you. You want to be better than you were before. You understand failure to be a teacher, and you will equate failure to be critical feedback that you will use to improve. I like to think about growth mindset as a garden. That is, we all have our seeds that want to grow. And in the environment, the clinical learning environment, we need to cultivate the garden. In the literature, this is known as the get better mindset or incremental theory. Now, if you have fixed mindsets about yourselves, then you'll also, you might also have fixed mindsets about others and in particular others that you teach. If that's the case, then you would understand that learners have uh, permanent traits and if that's the case, there's only one thing to do, that's sort. You want to identify who are the good ones, who are the bad ones, who are the weak ones, who are the strong ones, right? And that's judgment. You would praise talent and intelligence when they succeed. And when they fail, you console them because you know they would not have been able to do it under any circumstance. So console is the right response. And when they fail, the people that we are teaching, then we have to lower our expectations because there's no way they could overcome them. So again, these are consequences of having a mindset about others. Now you can have a growth mindset about others, in which case you understand that learners are developing people. Your role then is to develop them. Your role is to help them become better than they were before. You can still praise their deliberate practice, perseverance and strategies when they succeed. And when they fail, you can help them find the learning. And when they fail, you can maintain your high expectations and, and help them reach it. So I want to touch on some of the research uh, that uh, is linked with growth mindset. So one of uh, Carol Dweck's uh, uh, research projects was looking at teaching math to seventh graders. And, and they identified a group of seventh graders who are already testing in the 70th percentile and in a downward trajectory. And for one group, actually for both groups, they gave them study skills. And these study skills included mnemonics, things to help them remember. And so for that group that only got the study skills, before and after, there was no change in their GPAs for math. In fact, they had continued on their previous decline in terms of percentile ranking. For another group, they introduced the idea of a growth mindset. They said, oh no, you don't have to not be good at math. If you practice, if you get teaching, if you work hard, you can improve. That was it. That was fundamentally the only intervention. For that group, it changed their trajectory. They realized that they had capacity. Moving on to uh, adults who are a little bit older, we can look at uh, students in college and where much of this research is, is uh, discovered on. And so it might, it, mindset matters in response to challenges. So, First thing you can do, it turns out that you can condition people into these mindsets pretty briefly. To condition someone into a growth mindset, you can have them understand that the point of this exercise is to improve. This is an opportunity to develop your problem solving skill. That's the way you frame it. You can also condition people into a fixed mindset by saying the point of this test is to prove how smart you are. We will compare you to others. All right. And so the that's the two conditions and the task they were given were solvable logic problems. So they were given uh, a series of logic problems. They were asked to 
to solve them. What were the results based on the conditions of their mindset? Interestingly, fixed mindset performed better. In many ways, they had to because their identity was at stake. In this particular uh, outcome, growth mindset, uh, they didn't do as well. Interesting. But this is in a situation where it's controlled and the work is solvable. In another experiment, what they did is right in the middle of the time that the students were solving the logic problems, their computer would go blank and their task then was to type on their keyboard as fast as they could for about a minute. So essentially they simulated interacting with an electronic medical record. So they just had tap, 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 and then they continue on. So then how did mindset affect their performance when they were interrupted on this relatively simple task? Interestingly, even though it looks like growth mindset was a little bit higher, there, there was no different. Yet the experience was very different. In the fixed mindset condition, those students were very upset. You know, this, this interruption was intolerable to them, made them very sad. Whereas in the growth mindset condition, they said, hey, I guess I'm just gonna see how I do this project when I'm interrupted. Let's see how this goes. Same performance, different experience. There's a burgeoning neuroscience uh, looking at how do our brains process mistakes? And then in fact, how does, how does mindset influence this? And this experiment, undergraduate students, their conditioning for growth mindset was to read an article that said, your brain can develop. It talks about neuroplasticity and said that if you work hard, you can improve. Another, the other group in the fixed mindset condition, they were conditioned by reading another article that said, intelligence is fixed and unchangeable. So the conditioning is, is not that elaborate, yet can have impact. So then the task was to identify the discordant letter, the M amongst the Ns or the F amongst the Es. And so what they did then is they were looking for event related potentials that would indicate they were both recognizing that they were making mistakes and then processing that. This is, there's no sure sign of an opportunity to learn than making a mistake. And so in the growth mindset condition, the event related potentials associated with making a mistake and learning from it were very prominent. And so these were readily identified. So here the red denotes attention to mistakes and using those mistakes to learn and improve. They got better as they made more mistakes. So this is an example of becoming smart. Whereas in the fixed mindset condition, when they encountered the mistakes, those same event related potentials associated with recognizing and learning from those mistakes fell completely silent or were less prominent. This would be uh, an indication of the fixed mindset thief stealing the lesson right at the point that it's being taught. So broadly, there are other uh, outcomes that have been seen in uh, both high school and college where growth mindset can act as a buffer against demotivation. And interestingly, a 30 minute online presentation at a university on growth mindset, they called it university mindset, led to a 3% increase in students earning 12 or more credits, which itself was a predictor of graduation. So 30 minutes could change a graduation rate, really quite powerful. <clears throat> Now, those topics have all been about mindsets as they exist in individuals. I think it's also important that mindsets are promoted and encountered in organizations that can be features of organization and organizational structure. So what I wanna show you are a couple of organizational charts for big technology companies that you'll all be familiar with. This was in a New York Times article in uh, early 2013. And so this, of course, would be Amazon with Jeff Bezos at the very top or Facebook, should I say Meta, the social network. And so again, this is more of a play on the organization by way of its organizational chart. So Apple with the late great Steve Jobs at the center. And then as a Seattleite, there was Microsoft. Now, I've been here about 20 years. And so I can tell you when I would hear from my colleagues and really friends who worked at Microsoft, they would tell me it was a hard place to work. 
And in this organizational chart, there's a reason why it appeared this way. And one of the reasons why was the way that the evaluation system was structured at Microsoft is that regardless of whether or not you had the top performing group at Microsoft or the bottom performing group at Microsoft, you still had to rank all of your subordinates as best employee, worst employee. So it was for strength. That type of managerial approach can really create a fixed mindset in an organization because it's competition and it becomes real. So what do you do? Because you're Microsoft, you have 100,000 employees spread all over the world. How do you change that environment and that culture? Is it even possible? And so if you're Satya Nadella, the new CEO of Microsoft, you hit refresh. And so he brought in growth mindset into the managerial team. In fact, Carol Dweck wrote about it, how Microsoft uses growth mindset to develop leaders. For a time, you could go on the Microsoft culture page and you could see they are very explicit about growth mindset. At Microsoft, we are insatiably curious, always learning. We ask questions, take risks, and build in each other's ideas because we are better together. We lean into uncertainty, take risks, and move quickly when we make mistakes because we know failure happens along the way to innovation and breakthrough. And so it's possible. Microsoft went from a know-it-all culture to a learn-it-all culture. And they're not alone. There's other organizations that have embraced growth mindset. So LinkedIn, Sephora, international beauty company, I've seen their management materials. They were teaching growth mindset to their managers. The next icon would be for uh, my organization, Virginia Mason, where this idea fits very easily. And then there are teams, sports teams, that if you listen to the language that the teams are using, they are using sports mindset. I picked the Seattle Seahawks not only because that's where I'm from, because I know they've had sports psychologists that talk about growth mindset with their teams. So now that you've heard a little bit about what these mindsets are like, maybe you might be thinking you can recognize it in yourself and others. And so I want you to pause and think, of the people I know, what percent do you think tend to have more fixed thoughts or what percent tend to have more growth thoughts? And I'll have you put a percentage in your head and tell you, for the most part, it's about evenly distributed. And so in the general population, according to Carol Dweck, there's about 50-50 with a group that was around the middle. For law students, which I picked because they're comparable to uh, medical students and uh, medical trainees, it's about mixed as well, about evenly distributed. All right. So at this point, I'm going to pause. We can sort of reflect. And this is what I want you to get out of what it means to have a growth mindset. A growth mindset doesn't mean that you can do anything. Rather, it means you can change and that your potential is unknown. Your task as a person with a growth mindset is to be better than you were before. And as a teacher with a growth mindset, you wanna believe that others can change too. Also the same for leaders. You can do, you have the capacity to do difficult things and there is only one failure in a growth mindset and that's the failure to learn. So let's transition to think about what growth mindset means in medical education. So graduate medical education, the training of residents and in particular internal medicine residents. So those of you familiar with the milestones, milestones 2.0, can see under practice-based learning and improvement, reflective practice and commitment to personal growth. And so knowing who the people were and are who are really architecting our milestones, it is no surprise that they explicitly and implicitly are looking at growth. So six opportunities to improve, six performance data consistently with adaptability and humility, uses performance data to measure effectiveness of individualized learning plan and when necessary improves. So you can see here there are echoes of growth mindset into this. As with the general population, there's really not too much known about the distribution of growth mindset among medical educators and residents. And so I did come across a few articles. And so one looked at pediatric attendings and residents, pediatric attending and residents. So I want you to think 
what percentage of these pediatric attendings and residents would have more fixed thoughts versus growth thoughts? Now, mind you, these are pediatricians. They literally have growth charts where they measure their circumference of kids' brains, head circumference, while they grow. What percentage of those physicians do you think have growth versus fixed? And it's about the same. And I think it's what you get in an environment where you don't really talk about it. And so for whatever reason, today, 2022, the split ends up becoming about even. And across another article uh, where you really start thinking about specific domains. And so this is amongst clinical supervisors. And I think quite uh, optimistically, 92% of these clinical supervisors believe that clinical reasoning can be developed, which means really there's 8% that think you get what you get. Interestingly, fewer percentage, 55, 47% think that empathy, intelligence, moral character can be developed or changed. So I think we do have opportunities to grow. So another place where uh, these mindsets appear, actually for all of us, is in our self-talk. Our self-talk is the constant conversation that we're having with ourselves. And so many people can hear that conversation. They can hear what they're saying to themselves. And it's one place where we identify where fixed and growth thoughts are. It's one place in the literature where they uh, establish where someone is on a, on, a, uh, on a distribution. And it's important because today you'll have about one thought a second, about 50 thoughts a minute, about 3,000 thoughts in this hour, 50,000 thoughts a day, 1.5 billion thoughts in your lifetime. And so an important question to ask is, how's that conversation going? Uh, are you your best coach or are you your worst critic? Is hearing yourself talk something that gives you energy or one that takes it away? And so let's take a, an exploration into what these thoughts might be amongst our residents. And so those of you who are faculty, or if you're a resident, you can speak out of your experience. And we can listen to how these mindsets occur in our thoughts. So consider this scenario where you're going to listen for a mindset. In fact, I'm going to have you try it on. What do they, this means residents, think when they are on wards or in conference and their attending discovers a knowledge gap? Okay, this is an opportunity then to, to interact. I want you to put on a fixed mindset hat and imagine what would a resident think if, if they are on wards or in conference and an attending discovers a knowledge gap? All right, so let's see if we can get some activity in the chat. Try on your fixed mindset hat. I'm going to take a sip of coffee. Yes, thank you very much. I'm never going to know this. Oh, I shouldn't be here. That's exactly panic. I'm absolutely. Hope I don't make a mistake. That's right. Okay. This is great. Thank you for those who, are, who have shared. <laughs> I'm not going to say that one, but I know the impulse. That's fantastic. All right, I tell you, this can happen very quickly. I failed, I'm not good enough. Okay, these are painful uh, responses that happen all the time, all right? Everyone else knows this comparison. Okay, so you get a real sense that these mindsets can be quite alive in the experience of our trainees and ourselves. All right, so let's cleanse the palate. I now want you to put on a growth mindset hat and conjure different thoughts because this is something that you can do, you can decide. So if you are a resident and you are in clinic or in conference and you're attending discovers a knowledge gap, if you have growth thoughts or steer yourself in that direction, what might you say to yourself? Let's see. Teach me, that's great. Oh, you guys are lighting this up. It's a great opportunity for me to learn something new. It's oh, awesome. Let's get to work, that's right. Okay, you guys are, you guys, you guys are, uh, you guys are really catching on. So I'll tell you what what I do because as a clinician for twenty years, you are revealed every day in terms of what you don't know. 
And so then how do you frame that? So one way I think about it is I think of it like an over the air update to my phone. If I learn something new, then it's like my phone got updated. There's nothing wrong with that. It just means, hey, new features, upgrade, update. And that's a good thing. So great, you guys are getting this. So again, sort of thinking about how these mindsets occur in the language that is present in our, in our heads. And so perhaps some of you might be able to finish this sentence. Better to keep your mouth shut and be thought a fool than, and I'll tell you the rest, open your mouth and remove any doubt. And so that is a really uh, fixed thought. It's a thought that uh, speaks to exposure, to uh, being identified. Um, to, uh, there are a couple other phenomena that I think have a relationship to fixed mindset thoughts, and those would be perfectionism and the imposter phenomenon. I really think about these as related to your relationship to mistakes. So perfectionism might be, if I am perfect, be perfect, do perfect, then I can, I can avoid the pain and embarrassment and shame associated with making mistakes. Whereas the imposter phenomenon is about your past mistakes. And so the imposter phenomenon might be someday, everyone will find out all those things that I did wrong and, it'll, and they will recognize just as I do that I don't belong. Uh, and so those are also very much uh, in this ilk of, of fixed thoughts. So then what do you do? How do you navigate around that? Well, you can do this. If you catch yourself having a fixed thought, then substitute a growth thought. And so for perfectionism, you can remind yourself that you are a work in progress. And for the imposter phenomenon, your mistakes are why you succeed. Uh, things to consider. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, this is very interesting, uh, this fixed mindset, growth mindset. It may not apply to me. It might not apply to my experience. Well, let's find out. So there's a real easy way to find out where you have or might have fixed thoughts. And that's by filling in the blank. And so if you sit with this long enough, I can't. Whatever your brain that tells you you can't do, that might be a place where you have fixed thoughts. For many people, it's about art. I can't draw. For some people, this isn't an issue. For everyone else, what if I told you what I was going to do is we were going to share screens and I'm going to have each one of you draw your self portrait. We're going to watch each other do it and then you will submit it and then we'll have a competition to see who is the worst and I guess the best drawer at Washington University. Okay. If that sounds like a horrible idea, then welcome to having some fixed thoughts because we all have them. So here are some people who also said that they could not draw. And I think they sell themselves short because all four of these people really have a future as police sketch artists. They just didn't know it. Seriously, what they all were were people who wanted to learn how to draw and what they thought was they can't draw yet. They enrolled in a class called Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain. And after one week of deliberate practice, coaching, technique, spending time, mistakes, this is what their drawings look like. It's a phenomenal change in their capacity. And so it is, you can get better even at things like art. So we're now gonna start transitioning. Well, actually, so I, how can you do that? Anytime you hear the word, I can't, you can invoke the power of yet and say, I can't yet. So this is your first or one of many uh, suggestions in how to shift your mindset. And the power of yet really comes back and it's even present in our own milestones. So if you look in milestones 2.0, what I didn't show you was what's at the bottom right, which says not yet completed. So how else can you start shifting your mindset? Another way would be to start reframing how you understand your mistakes and your relationship to mistakes. 
And so you could take an Einsteinian approach, which is to say anyone who has never made a mistake has never tried anything new. You could reframe it as Edisonian mistakes when you're learning, which would be, I've not failed a, a thousand times. I've successfully discovered a thousand ways that did not make the light bulb. Or you can reframe your mistakes in learning in a Rosarian tradition, which is we don't make mistakes. We just have happy accidents in the context of learning. We all know who the greatest teacher is. Hey, wasn't it just May the 4th yesterday? All right. So now let's talk about why mindset matters if you are a manager or an educator. Right. So this is research done at a large uh, power company that manages nuclear power plants, hydroelectric dams, uh, a field of high consequence. And so what they wanted to do was to train managers to evaluate. So to orient you to what I will show you on this graph, so on the vertical axis would be performance rating on a task. And this is structured uh, performance. And so there's defined ways that you can uh, evaluate. Along the horizontal axis is evaluator mindset. And so you can go online or, or take formal um, surveys to identify where is your mindset? Do you tend to have more fixed thoughts? Do you tend to have more growth thoughts? So fixed thoughts would be on the left and growth thoughts more on the right. In this study, again, in, in this high stakes uh, uh, power company, they showed videos to managers. And these videos were anchored, the first one, to poor performance. And so that actors, they were doing a task and they were instructed to perform poorly by metric. And so what this horizontal line represents would be if mindset didn't matter, then the evaluations should be very close to that graph. And that's ended up, that's ended up happening. So here, when they had their evaluators actually do the, the evaluation where the behavior was anchored to poor performance, there was no difference. So it didn't really matter on the first video, whether or not you had a fixed mindset or a closed mindset. Then they showed this group, the same actors performing differently. In fact, their behavior on this task was anchored. So it was intended to represent higher performance. So they performed better. And then they wondered, did mindset matter in terms of the managers? And it did. So what they saw was that first impressions for those managers with fixed mindsets were very sticky. If they didn't think other people could change, they didn't see it when it happened. Whereas in a growth mindset, those managers, they recognized that change was occurring. And so a criticism might be, well, wait a second, you know, it's just those people who have growth mindsets, they're just way too optimistic. And so what they did is they reversed the order of the videos in a second group. So in the second condition, the first video they showed was the high performance. And they wanted to see this mindset difference when the first video you see is high performance. And for the most part, it was, again, pretty flat, which again means that they were evaluating them similarly. Now, this is a, uh, a session intended to teach evaluation. So it looks like they, they evaluated them very harshly, but it didn't matter whether or not they had tended to have more fixed thoughts or growth thoughts. Then they showed them the second video, same actors doing behaviors that were anchored to be at lower performance. So what happened with them? And again, first impressions mattered for those with a more fixed thoughts. It was sticky. And so you can think of this as sort of the, the uh, angel effect or the, the halo effect for both poor and um, high performance, first impressions were just very sticky for those people who had tended to have fixed thoughts. So this, I think, would be amongst the most compelling reasons why it's important for our mindset to be developed, in particular, in our faculty. So then how do you do that? How do you change mindset? In the study, they did it in five steps. The first one involved PowerPoint, and then a series, a writing exercise, where they explored different questions. So let's go through their intervention. 
their first step was with PowerPoint. So it turns out in many experiments, growth mindset conditions are set up using PowerPoint. In fact, PowerPoint's quite similar to this one. And so it introduced growth mindset to your residents and faculty. There's a reasonable chance that just hearing about it, if you've not heard about it, can change your trajectory if, you've, if you're interested. So that's the first step, introduction. Second would be a series of writing exercises. So this could be done in an hour. One question answers, as an educator, what are at least three reasons why it is important to realize that people can develop their abilities, include implications for both yourself and others you will teach? Pausing, reflecting, answering that question will begin to have you reflect on why it's important and ostensibly change your mindset. A third step would be to ask a how question. This is a really good one. What is an area in which you once had low ability, but now perform quite well? How were you able to make this change? And this is one you can take out of this context. If you are working with someone, you can remind them, hey, you have already changed. Give me an example of how you've changed already. And that'd be a great way of coaching someone. The next would be mentoring. And this can be done either virtually or in reality. So write an email to someone who is struggling. Share with them examples of how abilities can be developed. So it turns out that mentoring not only helps the mentee, it transforms the mentor. So this is another example of how you can change your mindset. And finally, and perhaps most powerfully, you can do a surprise question. Identify when you have been surprised by someone who learned what you thought they could not learn. Why do you think that occurred? Reflect on its implications. So somebody that you thought could not learn, learned. Their surprise is really two. One is that they learn. And then two is that your thinking of them is wrong, or at least requires an update or could be updated. And that, answering that question, reflecting on that question, all of these questions potentially can change your mindset. So when they looked at this, they identified a group of managers who tended to have, or at least on these scales, uh, identified as having more fixed thoughts and immediately post that intervention, those five steps, they had flipped their mindset. And that was durable at two and six weeks. So it's possible. So of course, mindset is not without pitfalls, challenges, and there is a, an interesting future. So what are some of the pitfalls? One of the pitfalls would be things that Carol Dweck calls false growth mindset. So the first one beat, I already have a growth mindset. I always have, I was born with a growth mindset. Okay, there's no such thing. Pure mindset does not exist. We all have fixed thoughts. Okay, a growth mindset is something that you have to cultivate. Another false growth mindset thought would be just praise and reward effort. Well, praising and rewarding unproductive effort is unproductive, so choose wisely. Another thought would be people who have fixed mindsets can't succeed. On the contrary, they have to. It compels them. That mindset forces you to. And while a fixed mindset might make you very good, it'll create a limit on what you can do because it's very difficult to outperform your self-image. <clears throat> At this point, you might be wondering, wait a second, hey, what if we just recruit uh, growth mindset, only recruit for growth mindset, or let's find the people with the most growth mindset and only make them leaders, or let's find all those fixies and get rid of them. So that might be an appealing thought, and I'll tell you, it's a trap, because that thought, as appealing as it might sound, is amongst the most fixed thoughts. It is this thought that people with a fixed mindset can't change. And that is an opportunity. And so at this point, it's also probably to, uh, one of the questions I frequently get, we might even get it now, is what if one of the, a superior, somebody who's above me has a fixed mindset? What do I do then? Okay, and the, the initial response is the first thing you have to do is you have to release your idea that they're fixed and then look for ways that in fact they have changed. 
And then you might even manage up and ask them, can you tell me a time when, when you learned something new? How did you do that? And that'd be a way of actually creating space for them to share how they can grow. Now, as I've been talking about growth mindset over time, it became increasingly clear to me that we had to start talking about the experience of it. Because we can talk about making mistakes, we can talk about growing, we can talk about taking risks. Yet, every time you do that, you experience vulnerability. And vulnerability, as defined by Brene Brown, would be the confluence of uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. So you make a mistake and there's uncertainty. What's going to happen next? You make a mistake and there's risk, which is high, con which is high consequence. Could something happen bad to me? Right, in the process of learning or emotional exposure, which would be you have an emotion and another person has an emotion or you can't manage or read the emotions in the room. So all of those things combine to create the experience of vulnerability. So you can argue that learning is in fact a state of vulnerability. At the same time though, anytime that you continue when you feel vulnerable, you are also demonstrating courage because courage does not exist in the absence of vulnerability. So once you start talking about vulnerability, then you have to start talking about shame because the experience of learning, again, will come with these emotions. It's important to differentiate these negative self-affects. So feelings you have about yourself, the negative self-affect, and the two we'll talk about are shame and guilt. And so guilt is, I made a mistake or I did something wrong. Shame is, I am a mistake, or there's something wrong with me. You can see, I'm going to postulate that there's a relationship between growth mindset and fixed mindset. So guilt is, it's about what I did, whereas shame is about who you are. Now, uh, guilt, as uncomfortable as it is, ends up being a constructive negative self-affect. You can do something with it. You can say, guilt is charged. How do I make this right? And so you can do something. Whereas shame, you end up getting a different set of responses. You can run, you can hide, you can attack and defend. The differences between these two might seem semantic, yet in consequence, shame is related to addiction, bullying, depression, and even suicide. Whereas guilt is inversely related. And so I'll make the, the stand that if you can navigate towards guilt in these uncomfortable self-affects, uh, it'll be constructive. Okay. I'm going to make sure that we are doing well on time. So it's shame. So this is a, uh, if you're more interested in learning more about it, there's a really good series by Dr. Will Bynum, where he both defines shame, talks about things that can cause it, factors that can contribute, and then the negative effects, which includes impaired well-being, disengagement from learning. And so there's the, there are the references and his call to action to understand it further. And so other challenges, you know, there have been many uh, educational fads, if you will, is growth mindset gonna be one of them? And the, decade prior, there were two uh, large meta-analyses that argued that the effect size for growth mindset and interventions on students was really quite moderate. And, and when you look at the, the effect sizes for growth mindset were comparable to uh, working on faculty education in general or for at-risk students equivalent to class reduction size. And so what I would say is that while these effect sizes might seem um, moderate, the cost effectiveness of it is really profound because these are one hour interventions versus reducing class size for an entire year. As you can see that for me, the, the, the value proposition for growth mindset is quite high. In a 2019 study, uh, Carol Dweck and her colleagues, and colleagues including Angela Duckworth, uh, found that they actually found a larger effect size. And they also started looking into the nuance of it, including the effect of peer groups. And so as residents, can you support an environment where others can take risks in the purpose of learning? Because that ends up being a positive moderator towards it. In medical education, uh, competency-based medical education, there's an increasing interest in 
and growth mindset. So you know, colleague Eric Warm is part of this paper. And if you really want to understand really the state of art of, of growth mindset and competency-based education, this is the right place to look. Other challenges that I will have you ponder is that this is a theory. It's a, it's a theory about how we understand how the world works. It's one that is really useful, right? But, it's, but I would keep it as that. It is a very useful model. I certainly expect growth mindset to be both improved, perhaps even superseded, and that's okay, right? And so uh, an example of the difference between uh, useful and wrong. And so one of these photos is an actual photo of Seattle. The second one is from Google Maps. And um, the Google Map one is wrong because you know, it's not raining and there's no traffic. It's really useful. It'll help me get around Seattle. Okay, and that's I way I think of growth mindset in a similar way. Growth mindset is increasingly being adopted in medicine uh, residency programs, and so here is a small sample of a list of residencies, and it's growing. And the future is going to be really interesting. So, what if our patients had growth mindsets? What if we could instill it in them? There's some evidence that teaching patients about growth mindset can lead to improved health outcomes. So it's not just for us. And then Tate Shanafelt in his uh, conversations uh, about burnout identifies vulnerability and growth mindset as important features for physician well-being. And so there's a future and I'm looking forward to seeing where this goes. And so with that, I've given you an introduction. We've talked about some application. I've given you some challenges. I want to express some gratitude to uh, my residents. And we didn't talk about where growth mindset comes from, but that's my parents. And with that, we'll end. How did I do? Oh, good. We got some time. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you so much for your talk. Thank you for being here today. Um, uh, as a reminder, if anyone has any questions, please go ahead and throw them into the chat. Uh, to maybe start one off, is there any look or work into how durable a fixed mindset can be if it's there for a longer amount of time. I guess I'm speaking as a worried parent of young children. If, if I inadvertently, you know, fix them in their mindset, if that's there for the rest of their life, does that make it much all that much harder to become a growth mindset in that area? Yeah, so this is a great question. So how malleable are we? And that's really the big question. I would say that, you know, we didn't talk too much about where these mindsets come from. They come from our experiences. And so both people and the environment can change, can influence people's mindset. Now, as a parent, and so Carol Dweck's work is largely on, on kids, what you want to do is cultivate their experiences. And so you are not destined to always have fixed thoughts simply because that's what you emerged out of your experience from. What you want to do then is to cultivate experiences that will let you see that in fact you can change. And so as a parent, it would mean like point out like, hey, you used to not be able to walk, right? Or as they develop, help them identify those points where they have changed. Okay. This, this is the same then also for, for any person that you can, you can let them know. Are you different than you were before? How were you able to make that transition? There are future changes that you're going to make. And so let's start predicting what those are. So you, so once fixed, not always fixed. Thank you for that. Uh, another question in the chat says, do you find there's a correlation between neurodivergence and mindset? Like a difference in ability to shift between one or the other mindset for neurodivergence versus mm -hmm. neurotypicals or a favorability toward fixed or growth for neurodivergence? Really interesting question, one that I've not thought um, thought of before and one that I uh, will pause before I give too much um, thoughts because my experience with neurodivergent, non-neurotypical is really infrequent. So I'm probably not the right person to, to answer that question. In other words, I'm saying, I don't know the answer yet. Now what, but I think there's a possibility. And I would say, although I would say that the possibility is not destined, I could also see just as equally, depending on where you're coming from, that you could take another route. One route, you could also probably imagine uh, uh, theories that would say non-neurotypical could be more fixed at the same time that you could also think non-neurotypical could be more growth. And so I think it uh, probably depends on, on 
how it's studied um, and, and, and how you think about it. So I don't have a good answer for that. It's probably the best, one of the best questions I've heard uh, around that. Uh, and so sadly, I don't have an answer and I don't want to. Right. Not, not a problem. Not a problem. Well, yeah. One of our uh, teaching fellows has uh, sort of a comment slash question. If looking at growth and fixed mindset, it, it's a pretty dichotomous process there. But I guess he's familiar with Dweck's work, says there, you know, it, there's some more complex theories underneath that, looking at expectancy value or achievement goal theory. Should we be teaching more of those kind of complex theories to faculty and grad? graduate medical education, are we missing anything? Are there consequences of presenting a simplified view of this? Yeah, so I think you should absolutely continue because this talk, what as has been presented, and I appreciate your uh, thoughtfulness and expertise around it, this is a 101 level introduction. So this is just to get the construct into people's heads. And that's the whole purpose of this talk. It's really an introduction. At a 200 level, you start thinking about how do you really change mindsets? How do you start um, having people have a conversation with their mindset and not only you know, recognize it, but then be able to um, influence it. At a 300 level, you start thinking about like, how do you harness it? How do you start using your mindsets, both of them to your advantage? And now, now it sounds like that you're doing some other research. I think that the area, the, the field is ripe for for um, innovation. And so uh, I would absolutely continue forward. Absolutely continue forward. Now, do I think there's a consequence of stopping? It, it's all those false growth mindsets. That would be the, the risks because if you give a real basic introduction and stop there, it can be totally um, eaten by the environment and it can be used for the purposes of an environment. So many places when you start talking growth, they start talking about financial growth and then growth mindset becomes this idea of like, let's, let's grow financially. And that would be totally co-opting it. You really haven't changed that environment, rather the environment has co-opted the construct. And so I would absolutely keep on drawing, keep on discovering. And probably more importantly, like what you want to do in your own environment is shape it um, actively. So if these are things that you are doing to change your environment, more power to you. I'm not sure how best to frame this question. I guess when I hear you, some of the work you're talking about in terms of fixed mindset, I, I can't help but hear echoes of implicit bias. Um, you know, is there a correlation between, uh, you know, how we approach different groups of the fixed mindset in terms of gender, race, socioeconomic, economic status, and maybe a discordance between the those groups? So, so I'm not familiar with the research. I imagine it's out there. If I were to conjecture, um, all our thoughts are predictions, right? And so if you already come from a mindset that says people's talents, skills, and abilities are um, fixed, then you will see it in your environment and you will predict that. And so I think there's a really clear link then to say, if you don't think other people can change and they are who they are, you will find it where it doesn't exist and you will impose it um, as a prediction and then then it's up to you to understand whether or not it's there or not. And so I think there is a risk and it might be a way, uh, a pathway towards those sort of biases. Again, it also leads us out because then you can say, well, can you give people experiences where they see, in fact, people can change that then becomes the prediction. And then we see it. John, do we got any more? Ah, sorry, Zoom uh, <laughs> misbehaved on me. Uh, I actually think uh, we are uh, right at about time there. So let me extend a warm thank you again for joining us. I see the sun is rising behind you in Seattle. <laughs> so I uh, hope the rest of your day is excellent and really appreciate your time and expertise and for sharing this information with us. Thank you. for. Thank you. You guys had the best questions. Those were really challenging. And so um, every talk gets a little bit better because of the questions you ask. And so I'm going to pursue those. Uh, John, if you could send those to me, I'd, I'd really appreciate it. Yeah, will do. Will do. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone. Okay.